Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people should be aware that this presentation could contain images, names and information about deceased persons. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land on which we stand and pay my respects to the Jagra and Turrbal people. I would like to acknowledge all Elders past, present and emerging. Hi, my name is Siobhan Webster and my presentation today deals with cultural appropriation by Elizabeth Jurek and a scandal that rocked the Australian art world in the late 1990s. Indigenous people have been misrepresented, disrespected and mistreated since the arrival of Europeans to Australia. The visual arts provide a clear example of how easily cultural appreciation can cross a boundary to cultural appropriation and exploitation. The case of Elizabeth Jurek and Eddie Barb took cultural appropriation to an almost unbelievable new level. So the creation of a fictitious Aboriginal man, Eddie Barb, Jurek crossed multiple boundaries, raising questions about the responsibilities, representations and relationships she had towards and with Indigenous Australians. Elizabeth Jurek was an 80-year-old white artist from one of Western Australia's squatocracy families. She was already well-respected as an artist in her own right. Eddie Burrup, reportedly born in 1915, was an Aboriginal man from the Pilbara region of Western Australia and his paintings first appeared publicly in 1995 in a gallery curated by Jurek's daughter, Perpetua. In 1996, Native Title Now, part of the Adelaide Festival of Art, invited Burrup to exhibit works. Later that year, Barb applied for inclusion in Telstra's 13th National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Art Awards, and he subsequently sent two paintings to be hung. These awards were limited to Indigenous artists. For two years, the ruse continued until Jerick admitted she had created Barb as her alter ego. The art world was stunned, and Aboriginal artists bubbled with anger after learning she was the woman behind the man. She had deceived both groups. Jerick, however, believed that she had done nothing wrong. Jerek had sought public acclamation by masquerading as Aboriginal and justified the carefully constructed light by asserting many artists of the past created masterpieces under pseudonyms. Her revelation sparked a continuing debate in the art industry on cultural appropriation. What was truly outstanding was Jerek continued to paint under the pseudonym Eddie Burrup until she died in 2000. Jurek refused to accept the accusations of cultural appropriation and seemed to dismiss the storm that ensued. She also took no responsibility for her actions while painting as Eddie Burrup. In one interview she said, All I can say to that is that you can't appropriate something that was given freely to you as a gift, both with my inner perceptions and my direct contact with the original people of Australia. This response was highly controversial as many within the Aboriginal community felt she had stolen an identity which was not hers to take. The then senior curator of Aboriginal art at Sydney's Museum of Contemporary Art, John Mundine, said, It's an obscenity. It's like Kerry Packer pretending to be Mahatma Gandhi. Wayne Bergman from the Kimberley Aboriginal Law and Cultural Centre described her actions as the ultimate act of colonialism. He said, In Aboriginal law, no one can take another's work or another's identity. Miss Jurek has failed to respect the very law and culture in which she claims empathy and understanding. Jurek believed the art of Eddie Burrup was a righteous endeavour as she had a lifelong personal relationship with Aboriginal people and believed she intimately understood their culture. Despite criticism, Jurek asserted she had the support of Indigenous people in her community and this excused her actions. She saw the criticism as mainly coming from Sydney-based Aboriginals. Jurek said, Some of the people challenging what I've done, with respect, I say, they are very little Aboriginal and they have not had the privilege of the context that I've had with the ancient world. Jurek went as far as describing Mundine as part Aboriginal as if that gave him a lesser voice in the debate. She described how some Aboriginals had contacted the Warangari community about the situation. Jurek said Barb's future was left to her classificatory son and when he did not object, she continued using the synonym. This rationale was rejected by the director of the Australia Council for the Arts Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Board, Lydia Miller. She said it is self-delusory to somehow imagine you understand best how to represent Indigenous people. Jurek never thought to consult with any members of the Indigenous community before the birth of Barb. She never shared the inspiration for Barb or even discussed with any Aboriginal if the approach she was taking was a form of cultural appropriation. 
It appeared Jura created Barb on a whim after a brief conversation with her daughter who thought her new paintings had a distinctively Aboriginal feel to them. Jurek decided that growing up surrounded by Aboriginal people was the only permission needed to become Barb. Jurek said, Eddie Barb is a composition of different people. Jurek ultimately exploited rather than respected indigenous culture. Jurek's attitude suggested a self-serving and biased approach. She had risked her relationship with the Aboriginal community and despite her protest that the art of Eddie Barb was an attempt to achieve a deeper appreciation of indigenous culture, she offended and disrespected them. Had she considered more than herself, she could have celebrated indigenous culture by working closely with Aboriginals to create new perspectives. Not only did Turek fail to take responsibility for her actions, she atrociously abused the representation of indigenous people. In effect, the scandal eroded the credibility of the indigenous art industry. The art buying public could no longer be sure that because something looked like Aboriginal art, that it was. Before the scandal, the National Indigenous Art Advocacy Association had been trying to define authenticity for trademark purpose on Aboriginal products. The association stipulated that only Indigenous Australians could produce genuine Indigenous art. However, John Mundine said this would have provided little protection in the Jura case, rather than celebrating Indigenous people by portraying a new perspective on their culture. She continued the cycle of misrepresentation and disrespect. As assistant curator of Aboriginal art at the Art Gallery of WA, Jella Minou Mia said, If you are a non-Aboriginal and you truly believe in reconciliation, you'll do it right. There was the possibility of creating cross-cultural exchange and giving credit to the Indigenous people with whom she worked. Mia said, You'll consult? You'll speak with Aboriginal elders and ask what your role can be. If you don't do that, you've still got the ethics and mentality of people who came here in 1788, which is that you can walk onto the shore and do what you bloody well like. If Jurek had done this, she might have still faced criticism, but the backlash may not have been as harsh as what she faced recreating herself as an Aboriginal man. Jurek could have salvaged her artistic and personal reputation if she had taken a different approach to this last chapter in her creative life. If she had been honest when the paintings of Barb were released and described them as a composition of the Aboriginal men she had known in her lifetime, she might have received the recognition she desired as an artist. Jurek might also have avoided fueling the anger of Aboriginal people who saw her as yet another symbol of a white colonial past trying to interpret their spiritual connectedness to country. Jurek saw the criticism as coming from Sydney Aboriginals who, in her opinion, had no real connection with the people she knew. She believed she had a more legitimate claim to country than they did, and this was her ultimate downfall. Jurek failed to understand that Indigenous Australia was more than the individuals whom she knew personally and that an Aboriginal in Sydney had as much right to be outraged by her lack of consultation and responsibility as those who lived on land owned by her family. This paternalistic arrogance demonstrated that there would never be a meeting of the minds between what Jurek believed she had a right to do as an artist and what was morally correct concerning the entire Aboriginal community. Jurek was a woman who committed cultural fraud, expecting the Aboriginal community to ignore it because it was her artistic right to do so. To shut down Barb would be to silence the creative forces within her. We all know what she should have done differently. However, she never felt inclined to consign Barb to the trash bin of artistic error.